These images are from the series Hyper by French photographer Denis Darzac. They depict the saturated and kitsch aisles of hypermarkets, but populated with suspended bodies, contorted and appearing weightless, levitating in midair, giving the impression of a temporary break from the laws of physics. Some of these bodies appear to float vacantly, and some appear in more violent repose, like they're in the immediate aftermath of a punch or a kick. This unexpected juxtaposition of the familiar and the surreal creates photographs that blur the boundaries between reality and imagination and create an otherworldly, dreamlike atmosphere. But what is it about these images that make them feel so unearthly and ethereal? Why do these figures look like they're floating rather than jumping? To explore the answers to these questions, we need to take a trip into the world of high-speed photography. High-speed photography is a fascinating and powerful form of image making. And it may be something that you've shied away from because maybe it seemed too technical and it can be very technical, but it doesn't always need to be. Because sometimes it can just be about releasing the shutter at the right point. So in this video, I want to look at high-speed photography as more of a concept for creating interesting images rather than being a technical exercise. I want to look more at how we capture a fleeting moment and seeing a view of our world that only photography can show us. So I'll take you through some practical tips and tricks for getting great high-speed images without having to invest in lots of expensive equipment. But first, I want to show you the work of some photographers who use high-speed photography in a variety of interesting ways. So let's start with a bit of history. This image is called Milk Drop Coronet, and it's by Harold or Doc Edgerton, the man who was known as the father of modern high-speed photography. Edgerton was an inventor and an engineer, and he pioneered a method of taking images with very controlled, very precise high-speed flashes. But as well as his revolutionary stroboscopic techniques, he also had a keen aesthetic sense and as such, his high-speed images have become regarded as seminal works of art within themselves. This milk drop coronet image showed people a view of hydrodynamic behaviour they had never seen before, and we still today don't fully understand why fluid forms this crown shape when a drop hits the surface. But the striking nature of this image didn't happen by accident. Edgerton spent years trying to achieve the perfect crown image. The choice of the vibrant red plate, the reflection, the dark background, the position of the lighting, the negative space, all these are aesthetic decisions, and the resulting image is beautiful. Edgerton was an artist as well as a scientist. Edgerton's stroboscope was capable of firing a burst of light that lasted less than one millionth of a second. This coupled with his ingenious method of using sound waves to trigger the flash, he was able to take images that froze a bullet in mid-flight as it sliced a playing card in two. Again, the choice to frame this image in this particular way, the blue background, the shallow depth of field, the choice to place the playing card on a small dark stand rather than a big visible clamp, so it almost appears to be floating in mid-air. All these decisions make for a powerful image. While technology has progressed massively, and we may be used to seeing high-speed shots of frozen motion these days, at the time, no one had ever seen anything like this before. No one had seen a bullet frozen in mid-flight, or the intricate details of how objects break up in a high-impact collision. Seeing the details of things that happen too rapidly for human beings to comprehend in real time is a fascinating subject for image making, but high-speed photography offers us so many more possibilities for innovative and striking imagery. It's not all about technological advances. In fact, one of the most famous examples of high-speed photography happened before Edgerton's milk drop coronet image, way back in 1948. It's called Dali Atomicus, and it was shot by Philippe Holzman. This image shows us a room full of seemingly floating elements, an easel, a painting, a chair, a stool, a cascade of water, 
Salvador Dali himself, and three cats. The furniture and the painting elements were simply hung on wires, which were retouched out in the darkroom. But Dali, the water, and the cats were all captured as they flew through the air. This shot took 26 attempts to get right, and to be honest, it's a testament to Holzman's expertise that it only took that many. Of course, this was back way before the convenience of digital imaging, and so each image needed to be developed in between takes to assess how it was working and what needed to be done the next time. Dali Atomicus is a shot bursting with energy. As surreal as these elements are, it looks like a frozen moment of a chaotic scene. The audience have been invited to step outside of our reality and observe it from the outside. But while time is frozen, the laws of physics still clearly apply. And this is very different to Dennis Darzak's Hyper series. In Darzak's images, the figures appear to be weightless, as though floating through the aisles of these otherwise deserted hypermarkets. This use of a familiar scene treated in this way leads to images that are visually surreal and unexpected. But beyond their superficial surreality, they hint at deeper themes of alienation and consumerism. They invite the viewer to reflect on the ways in which they navigate a world that can sometimes feel bizarre and disconnected. Darzak created these images by employing dancers and athletes to perform a series of jumps and flips while he captured the mid-air moment of action. But what is it about these images that make these figures flipping through the air at high speed feel so still, so dreamlike, rather than frenetic and energetic? The answer to this lies in a number of factors. A lot of it is to do with how he directs the subjects to move and the specific moment he captures, the gentle positioning of the limbs, the vacant facial expression. Compare these expressions with Halsman's shots of Dali. And getting that exposure at exactly the right time, that decisive moment where these dancers and athletes look weightless. But this on its own isn't enough though. There is also little to no motion blur. Darzak is using our subtle awareness of the human body and face combined with our subconscious understanding of the language of photography to manipulate our perception of time and therefore our interpretation of motion. In contrast to the meticulously choreographed work of Edgerton, Halsman and Darzak, photographer Ray Collins creates mesmerizing oceanic photography. Through his extensive experience and profound understanding of the dynamics of ocean waves, Collins has developed the ability to anticipate the perfect moment to capture the sublime interplay of light, water and frozen motion. His work can take on an almost abstract quality where texture and form are brought to the forefront. These split-second captures transform the frenetic and constantly changing nature of these large masses of water into solid, stationary sculptures. We're able to appreciate these transient forms in all their beautiful intricacies in a way that we can't see in reality. But while his images are imbued with a grace and a beauty, the delicate play of the reflections and the refraction of the sunlight, these frozen moments also carry a strong sense of the raw power of nature. You can really feel the weight and the force of these waves just on the pinnacle of breaking. These moments of stopped time carry an undeniable tension too, and a sense of our powerlessness in the face of the inevitable dominance of nature. Moving from capturing water in a naturalistic state to carefully orchestrated shots of liquid, photographic duo Jeremy Floto and Cassie Warner's Colorant series forms part of their Momentary Realities collection, and it's a capturing collection of high-speed photographs that explore the dynamic and vivid interactions of various pigments and dyes in water. The series captures colorful liquid in mid-air, shot at shutter speeds of up to 1 3,500th of a second. The resulting images showcase mesmerizing and intricate formations, amorphous forms in vibrant hues captured in unpredictable ways. One thing I find very striking about these images is the juxtaposition of vibrant energy against the natural and deserted environments. Rocks, grass, desolate dusty roads or vast sprawling landscapes in muted hues are the host for these explosions of color. 
The result is ethereal and surreal, these moments of beauty that have a strange alien quality to them. While Floto Warner's images are bursting with energy, UK photographer Lee Maudsley uses high-speed photography to change fleeting scenes of turbulent motion into serene images that feel quiet and still. A bunch of flowers exploding as it collides with a stack of dinner plates loses all its momentum and violence and becomes a calm and tranquil scene. The fragile delicacy of the flowers is presented to us in intricate detail as they appear to hover motionless in this scenario. Familiar objects now devoid of their context. These blank sheets of falling white paper are transformed into an immutable abstract sculpture, as is this electrical extension lead. While Maudsley achieves this partly through good technical knowledge of how to eliminate motion blur, it's also largely about the setting up of these shots in the right way and finding that perfect moment to capture the image. Why does this mass of screws look like a sculpture? Well, to start with, there's no motion blur, but it's more than that. These formations they make form a clear shape. There are no screws flying out of frame. There's no big gaps in their dispersal. They appear in a fairly even distribution and the screws range right from the top of the image right down to the bottom. They all point in different directions. In short, this image works because this is the perfect moment of the perfect drop. This is a type of photography that normally takes a lot of time and attempts to get right. Despite its meticulous setup and choreography, Halsman's Dali Atomicus took 26 attempts to get right. Harold Edgerton took several years before he was happy with his milk drop coronet image. Ultimately, we're all fallible human beings living in a chaotic world. We can't guarantee we can control all the elements we want in the right way at the same time. One of the big secrets to perfect high-speed photography seems to simply be time, determination and patience. So here are some tips and tricks for taking high-speed photos. Number one, understand the different types of capturing fast motion. Firstly, you need to understand that there are two distinctly different ways of capturing fast motion, with a fast shutter speed or with a flash or a strobe. And both have their advantages and disadvantages and both are appropriate in different circumstances. A fast shutter speed is good for capturing anything where you can't completely control the light. Basically, anything outside of a studio. Ray Collinger's work, for instance, is reliant on a fast shutter speed. Most digital cameras can go to either 1 over 4,000 or 1 over 8,000 of a second for their maximum shutter speed. With a flash, you can get up to around 1 over 25,000 of a second, which is three times quicker than 1 over 8,000, six times quicker than 1 over 4,000. So a flash is really capable of capturing much faster motion and freezing it a lot better, but you need to be able to control the light. I'll take you through that in a bit. Two, know your shutter speeds. Each situation will of course be completely different, but it's good to know roughly where you want to be in terms of your shutter speed, as just as a starting point. And this is especially important if you're shooting film because you can't check images as you go. One 250th of a second is a bit of a magic number here. It's roughly the place you want to be if you want to freeze fast moving people or traffic or flowing water. People walking, doing everyday normal things can generally be frozen with around 1 60th of a second and upwards. Remember, the faster your shutter speed, the less lights you're letting in with your camera. Three, don't rely on high shutter speeds to make a good shot. It's not always just about the speed. Your mise-en-scene is of equal importance. It still has to be a good photo. It's what sets Floto Warner's colouring series apart from the plethora of other high-speed coloured liquid images that you see everywhere. It still has to be a good composition. Think, would it still have value if it wasn't high speed? 
Dennis Darzak's images of floating people is not really about how fast his shutter speed is, it's about the surreal imagery he's creating. The fast shutter speeds are just one factor of many that combine to make his images mesmerising. The idea is more important than the technical elements. 4. Take lots of shots. You need to put the time in, it's going to take a lot of trial and error. If you're using fast shutter speeds, use burst mode to maximise each attempt. If you're using flashes or strobes, you'll be limited by what your equipment can do. Uh, some flashes have faster recycle times than others. Um, burst mode works with some, not with others. But as time goes on with the setup, you'll get better at capturing that moment. You'll get a better feel for what you're doing. You'll start to become a little more intuitively in tune with the microseconds of each release of the shutter. You'll find that you begin to get more keepers and fewer misses. 5. Pre-focus with manual focus. The last thing you want to have is your camera start hunting for focus, that split second you're trying to capture the action. It's generally a good idea to shoot with as small an aperture as you can get away with so that your depth of field is larger and everything is in sharp focus. And this will give you more leeway for things to move if you have a preset focus. However, with a fast shutter speed, you'll be trading off losing light. So you may need to find an aperture that's a good balance. Try to light your shot as well as you can. But if you can't control the lighting, you'll probably need to push your ISO a bit. So it's good to get to know how well your camera handles higher ISOs and know what you're prepared to go to. Although AI noise reduction in Lightroom and Camera Raw these days is pretty good. It's probably better to have a sharper shot with a bit of noise than an out of focus shot with a lower ISO. Number six, comp shots together in post. So if you're taking studio shots, you can create composite images from bits of several shots. Let me show you how I did this with the shot that I took of a cup of tea and I'll also take you through what I was doing so you can see how to shoot a studio style shot with basically not much more than a camera and a flash gun or two. So firstly I'm going to close all the blinds, try and make the room completely dark. Because I am using the flashes to freeze the action, I want any time that the shutter is open and the flashes aren't firing to have no effect on the image, so it needs to be completely black. So behind me here I've got my camera, I've got a softbox, and another softbox, and another flash down there, that's three flashes. It's a bit excessive but um, I'm just trying to get a nice composition, one flash to light the background and two soft boxes either side to light the side of the object. I'm framing up my shot. I think I might raise the camera a little bit just to see a bit more liquid in the cup. So I've set the focus to manual and I'm at 1 15th of a second shutter speed. And I've gone for 1 15th, but the shutter speed could really be anything. It doesn't really matter as long as it is under your flash sync speed. The aperture I've set to F20 so that everything will be in sharp focus. I'm at ISO 3200 and all the flashes are set to 1 16th power. Now you may wonder why I'm not shooting all the flashes at full power and lowering the ISO to get a cleaner shot. And this is because when you set a flash gun to shoot at a lower power, it doesn't dim the bulb, but rather decreases the duration of the flash. So 1 16th power is a much faster flash than a flash at full power. And I'm shooting on my Canon R5 and I know that I can get away with ISO 3200 with a bit of Lightroom noise reduction on that camera. So this is the balance of speed and light that I want to use. So we can see how that works out just taking a shot. Firstly, we've got to make it dark. Okay, so let's try dropping in a biscuit. Now, I'm probably gonna mess this up quite a few times. If you get a proper trigger, a sound trigger, or something that breaks a laser beam, then you're gonna get a very precise shot. You can change it with milliseconds and stuff. Those sorts of things are great. It can be done by hand, so I'm going to try and do it without having to buy any specialist equipment. So for a first attempt, that really wasn't that bad, although I've splashed my background a bit, got to got tea stains on it. I'm going to try and drop multiple biscuits and see how that works. Right, so I missed the splash that time. But I wonder if I can comp together the two shots. 
Well, it turns out I can, and this is what it looks like. This was pretty simple. I just cut out the biscuits using the quick selection tool and pasted them in the shop with the splashing tea. So all that's left now is to clear up this carnage that I created. And there's another tip for you. If you are going to do this, then make sure you cover everything because it will get splashed. High speed photography is generally thought of as a bit of a niche genre, but it is a skill that most photographers will need to call on at some point in some way or another whether that is creating art prints to sell and those sorts of shots do sell well, or nailing that confetti shot at a wedding. Because the notion of freezing a moment in time is basically the fundamental essence of photography. And high-speed photography is really just taking that concept to its extreme. I think we have to embrace the experimental nature of it as well. It's a key part of the process. I think if we can do that, then we can set ourselves up for potentially creating some quite interesting work. So I do recommend giving it a try. Um, it's a lot of fun um, and it has the potential to be extremely creative and it's not actually as difficult as you might think. I'll see you next time.